Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. I'm reporting on location in Lyme Regis where we've spent the last few days fossil hunting for Jurassic marine reptiles. We'll be making a video about our time in Lyme that will be out soon so be sure to look out for that. Anyway, in the headlines this week we've got a new species of Tyrannosaurus, the mystery of how Gigantopithecus went extinct, a new prehistoric croc and much more. Did I say extinct wrong? Starting off the news this week, Alexia Lopez, a researcher from the University of Central Lancashire, has identified a cosmic structure of galaxies in a ring that, according to our current understanding of the universe, shouldn't really exist. Well, I say ring, it's a little bit more like a corkscrew, but either way, it shouldn't exist. Our current mathematical understanding of the universe is defined by the standard model, a pretty comprehensive equation for how the universe works. However, this equation makes some assumptions about the universe, such as the maximum size structures in the cosmos can actually be, and this structure, dubbed to be the big ring, is far bigger than the standard model says is possible. Now, we already know the standard model is incomplete, as there are some things it doesn't explain, and structures exceeding this maximum size limit have been discovered before. In fact, another such structure, dubbed the giant arc, very imaginative the names here, was discovered by the same Alexia Lopez two years ago. So this discovery isn't going to throw our understanding of everything out of the window and make time travel suddenly possible, but we still shouldn't underestimate its overall importance to our understanding of the cosmos. These giant structures may well be key to unlocking some of the most compelling unanswered questions about how our universe works, and every new discovery is a breakthrough in itself on the road to expanding our understanding of physics at its larger scales and perhaps even its smallest. Also in the recent news is the unfortunate development that the Norwegian government has approved legislation that allows companies to apply for permits to prospect for minerals off the continental coast of Norway over an area covering 280,000 square kilometres. It is estimated that Norway's seabed contains large stores of cobalt, copper and rare earth metals at depths between 1,500 and 6,000 metres. The mining would focus on the massive sulphide deposits that have been found near inactive hydrothermal vents. Extracting these marine minerals would mean deploying robots to strip the upper layers of seamounts and sulphide deposits. Research has shown that the impact on the marine environment of using this technique is potentially catastrophic. It would generate significant noise and light pollution as well as producing sediment plumes and damage to the habitat of organisms relying on the nodules. These effects put marine biodiversity at risk and could possibly accelerate climate change. Scientists from around the world have been warning for years about the detrimental effect of deep sea mining on the marine environment, and Norway's legislation is at odds with the EU and the UK who have called for a temporary ban on the practice because of concerns about the environmental damage. It is however going to be many years before any mining will occur. As our knowledge of these fragile deep water ecosystems increases, we can only hope that these licenses will not be granted. If you would like to know more about the damage that deep sea mining can do to the marine environment, then please head over to the One World channel, which has a video about it. The link is in the sources. First up in the paleontology news for this week, it's looking like 2024 is going to be the year of the Tyrannosaurus, as new species of Tyrannosaurus itself has just been named. In addition to Tyrannosaurus rex, we now also have Tyrannosaurus macraensis, an older species by 6 to 5 million years that lived in what is now New Mexico. Now you may remember that back in 2022, other paleontologists tried to name two other species of Tyrannosaurus as well. I love that the emphasis was on tried. <laughs> but this new paper only briefly mentions that whole saga and states that the anatomical variation seen in the fossils assigned to T. macriensis is much greater than any of the variation between other Tyrannosaurus specimens. And therefore, this does seem like a much more solid case for another Tyrannosaurus species. Tyrannosaurus macriensis, despite being older, already seemed to have rivaled T. rex in size and also provides evidence suggesting that the Tyrannosaur subgroup Tyrannosaurini, which also includes Tarbosaurus and I can't say that, which also includes Tarbosaurus and Zucheng Ty <laughs> Tyrannus yeah. and yeah 
which also includes Tarbosaurus and Zucheng Tyrannus, actually originated in southern Laramidia, the ancient western island continent of North America. T. macriensis is represented by a single specimen unearthed from the McRae group of New Mexico, hence its species name. And the fossil material known for this dinosaur includes a partial skull including elements from around the eyes, mostly intact lower jaws, plus some isolated teeth and chevron bones. The features that are said to distinguish this species from T. rex include corneal bosses just above the eye socket that were quite low and positioned further back than in T. rex, and a dentary that's very shallow towards the rear with a convex lower back margin, plus several other specific anatomical details of the bones. Looking at the evolutionary relationships of T. macriensis, it's found to be positioned as the sister taxon to T. rex, and is therefore very closely related to it. The geologic age of this species is estimated between 72.7 and 70.9 million years old. Based on analysis of the dinosaur fauna in the region it was discovered, the anatomy of the Tyrannosaur itself and age constraints provided by an underlying ash layer that was radiometrically dated, plus discoveries of more dinosaur bones higher up in the rock layers. Interestingly, since T. macriensis seems to display a few derived anatomical characteristics that T. rex does not, this also suggests that this species was not the ancestor of T. rex and instead represents a side branch in Tyrannosaurian evolution, therefore implying that at least two giant Tyrannosaurid species probably coexisted in North America at this time. T. macriensis as well as the ancestor of T. rex. T. macriensis was a member of an endemic southern dinosaur community that also includes the giant ceratopsian Sierra ceratops, plus a titanosaur that might be Alamosaurus and a giant unnamed hadrosaur. The authors also suggest that this new species supports the idea that Tyrannosaurians originated in southern Laramidia and subsequently split, with one lineage dispersing to Asia and giving rise to Tarbosaurus and... Oh, how do you say it? Uh, Zucheng Tyrannus. Tarbosaurus and Zucheng Tyrannus, while the other remained in Laramidia and ultimately gave rise to T-Rex. So then, lots of very exciting things in this paper and it'll be interesting to see if the validity of this new species holds up in future studies, unlike the ones that came before. <laughs> Also in the recent paleontology news, there's been a fascinating paper investigating the extinction of the largest primate that has ever lived, Gigantopithecus. These enormous orangutan relatives inhabited southern Asia from 2 million to about 300,000 years ago, and are only known from fossils of their teeth and jaw fragments. But from these remains, it's clear they were huge animals estimated to stand three meters tall and have a body mass of 200 to 300 kilograms. That is a lot more than anyone in this room. <laughs> the exact cause of their extinction has been a mystery, but resolving it could help us to understand better the challenges faced by primate species in the region and what has drive the extinction of these animals in the past, and therefore how to help and conserve the currently living southeastern Asian primates. Using various different approaches to investigate the disappearance of Gigantopithecus, researchers have built up a timeline of the giant ape's demise based on 22 caves in southern China that preserve its fossilised remains, as well as a picture of the environmental changes that occurred during this time it existed for. They found that from 2.3 million years ago, the region comprised of a mosaic of forests and grasses that were relatively stable in their conditions and therefore provided the ideal habitat for Gigantopithecus. However, during the period of time when they went extinct, the environmental conditions became much more variable, with increased seasonality leading to changes in plant communities and forest structures. Despite other primates being able to adapt to these changes, such as the modern orangutan lineage, the samples of teeth from Gigantopithecus indicate there was a dwindling population around this time as they struggled to cope with the changes and ultimately died out. Gigantopithecus appears to have been fairly specialised for life in its preferred forest habitats, and the more variable seasons and changing habitats were unfortunately too much for the species to handle. It's a very interesting insight into this incredible prehistoric primate, and there are some important lessons for the conservation of modern species too. Also in the recent news, a new species of prehistoric crocodilomorph has been named this week too. Hams will be happy. <laughs> Found in early Cretaceous age rocks in Thailand, it's been named Varanasuchus. 
Oh, Sakonakonensis. Varanasuchus Sakonakonensis. Oh, that was good. Varanasuchus was chosen as it superficially resembles monitor lizards, the Varanids, since it has a relatively deep skull and slender limbs that held it up off the ground. This new species fills an important evolutionary gap between two extinct lineages of crocodilomorphs, helping to better resolve their relationships. In addition, certain features of its skull anatomy add support to the hypothesis that this species and other members of its extinct crocodilomorph lineage were terrestrial animals with semi-aquatic affinities. Like Nazar likes to say about Spinosaurus. Up next in the paleontology news, a new species of Aetosaur has just been named. Did I say that right? Aetosaurs are a lineage of Pseudosuchians that only lived during the Triassic period. And this new species is called Garzapelta mulleri. Found in Triassic rocks in Garza County, Texas, it's known from a pretty complete specimen that preserves a lot of the armour on its back. The anatomy of this dorsal carapace shows some interesting similarities to two different subgroups of Aetosaurs. And when the paleontologists investigated the evolutionary position of Garzapelta among other Aetosaurs, using various versions of a matrix containing all the anatomical characters of these reptiles, it actually came out in conflicting positions, showing that there seems to be some evolutionary convergence happening here that the matrix couldn't discern. The paleontologists therefore hypothesize that Garzapelta is a member of the Aetosaur subgroup known as Paratypothoracini, but has some armor anatomy that has convergently evolved with a different Aetosaur group, the Desmatosuchians. This would therefore explain the conflicting positions of Garzapelta on their evolutionary trees, as the anatomical characters of the armor seem to be driving the placement of the species even though they're the result of convergence, not an actual evolutionary relationship. It's a really interesting case study showing the limitations of phylogenetic analysis that can sometimes happen when they can't account for convergent characteristics. And it's also a fascinating new species of Aetosaur. And finally in the news for this week, it's been a long week, a paper has just been published reporting on fossilized skin from an amniote that dates between 289 and 286 million years ago, during the early part of the Permian period. Amniotes are the massive vertebrate group, including all reptiles, birds and mammals, and their many extinct relatives, but it doesn't include amphibians. The fossilized skin comes from an infilled cave system in Oklahoma and was preserved when the organic Organic material was quickly encased and infilled by oil seep hydrocarbons under anoxic conditions. The paper reports on preserved skin associated with a specimen of a species called Capturinus, a kind of early reptile which had a series of bands running down the vertebrae and appeared to be the cornified remains of the epidermis. Several fragments of amniote skin from unknown species were also found, and they show a pebbly texture somewhat like modern crocodilians, in addition to hinge regions like those of snakes, showing that this sort of epidermis structure had evolved a long time ago and was important for the survival of these animals in terrestrial environments. The study also claims that this is the oldest known amniote skin that we have, however as other researchers have pointed out on Twitter, there are actually some even older specimens with skin preservation that the paper just seems to ignore, so I'm not quite sure what's happened there. Nevertheless, it's still an amazing find. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. And again, be sure to look out for the video on our fossil hunting in Lyme Regis. I also hope you enjoyed the on location filming and please excuse the really loud buses and sneezing and the ghosts <laughs> turning the cameras on and off. I reverted to Jucantopithecus then. <laughs> That's quite good. Showing that there seems to be... <laughs> Quinn! <laughs> Perhaps it's gonna hate you. But no, I need to go back. <laughs> Ruining my take. Is a member of the Aetosaur subgroup known as Paratypothorus or... <laughs> Para... <laughs> How do you say it? Paratypo thoracini. Pi Paratypo. Pi what? Panini. Panini! She's always watching. <laughs> <laughs>